and the Alan Wallace is, is like not, not like a not a typical monk. He's a monk who cannot sit still in one place. So even while he was a monk, he went on to to get a degree in physics, uh, uh, and then he went on to study like neurosciences and psychology and and stuff, and and eventually he got one of those uh, PhD thingies that some of you might have. And then he, like people with PhDs, so he went on to become a professor in UCSB. And then he decided he couldn't sit still in UCSB. So he went on to found his own institute and he decided to take everything he's ever learned in life to try to advance the mind sciences. And when I heard about his work, I, I figured these are things that will be interesting to, to Google's, like mind sciences, mind sciences and everything. So I invited him to come visit, come eat with us and, uh, and share a talk. And uh, before I, I, I bring Alan Watt up, uh, just a reminder to all Googlers, please do not ask him any questions that uh, co contains information that is Google confidential. Thank you. And with that, Alan. I do. Well, it's quite a delight for me to be with you today. I've, been, I've known about Google like the rest of us for a long time. Delighted to be in the in the matrix here and to share some of my passions pertaining to understanding the nature of the mind, its potentials, the nature of consciousness. And as Meng mentioned, I've had a, a rather diverse background, but I have been blessed with extraordinary teachers in the Tibetan tradition, other Buddhist traditions, but also marvelous instructors in physics, philosophy of science at Amherst College, and then doing a very diverse PhD program at uh, Stanford University where it was ostensibly in religious studies, but taking courses in philosophy of physics and cognitive psychology, philosophy of mind, and trying to bring all of these together, to integrate them, my background being raised in the West, but then living for years in Europe and quite a few years in Asia, trying to integrate, to synthesize, and so that these various aspects of my own life, as a Buddhist monk for 14 years, but also physics student and so forth, could be all integrated and so that the various aspects of my own last 56 years on the planet would be all one kind of one integrated unit, so no part was isolated from the others. And it actually took a long time, because I've had, again, been exposed to so many diverse worldviews, ways of life, and so on. So what I'd like to share with you this afternoon is a vision of a possibility of a first revolution in the mind sciences. And this very notion is based on assumption, on an assumption that certainly can be contested. Probably everything can be. But the starting assumption here is that among the natural sciences, we had the first great revolution in the natural sciences, starting with Copernicus, building up momentum with Kepler, Galileo, and coming to its fulfillment, to its fruition with Newton. And so the first great revolution we had in the natural sciences was in physics and astronomy. And I would say, from my own perspective, it started with Copernicus, but with, ne with Newton, it came together. He brought it all together. And that's when that revolution stopped. And then we simply had a lot of excellent science, a lot of excellent physics after that. And then we move over to another discipline. The life sciences are plugging along, plugging along. And then 1859, Darwin comes out with his masterpiece. And so he started the first and the only great revolution we've had in the life sciences. I say it started with Darwin. It started building a momentum in the 1870s with Gregor Mendel, a Christian monk, with genetics, of course. And then it was building momentum, building momentum, key point one century after Darwin, 1959, Crick and Watson DNA. We finally found now the mechanics. How does this happen? The natural selection, how can species mutate? Darwin didn't tell us. Mendel gave us a hint. Crick and Watson pointed, there is the machinery. And so following that, we've had this extraordinary growth, this spectacular growth in the study of genetics. And I would say that great revolution starting in 1859 has, co has come to culmination. It's over. And it was with the Human Genome Project. We've mapped it, something like 99% now. Well done. And now we, of course, the study of biology, of genetics will continue. But it was, it was 140 years. And interestingly enough, it's probably just a coincidence, but it was 140 years also from Copernicus through Newton. It took 140 years for the, for the revolution to start and then go, voila, there it is. We've also had a second great revolution in physics, and it started with Max Planck in 1900. It picked up momentum in 1905 and 1915 with the special and general relativity theories from Einstein. It was truly a revolution, and by revolution I mean, the, to use 
the familiar phrase, the paradigm has shifted. Your fundamental orientation towards the subject matter has shifted and it will never be the same. From a geocentric to the heliocentric, from pre-Darwin to post-Darwin, nothing's the same. You cannot look at human existence. You cannot look at the planet in the same way anymore. It's fundamentally, your, your axis has rotated. That second great revolution in physics, it's not over. 106 years, if we start in 1900, when Max Planck came out with the notion of quantum. It's not over. There are some core, crucial, fundamental issues in quantum mechanics in particular have not been solved, the most important of which I would say is a measurement problem. How is it that you move from a, a, mental, a, 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 a mathematical abstraction of a probability function, which is hardly physical, it's a pure abstraction, but prior to making a measurement, that's what you have. You have a probability function, a Schrodinger wave equation. And then you make a measurement and voila, now suddenly you have an electron that is here. It still doesn't have simultaneous exact momentum and location, but at least it's a real electron, photon, what have you. But what is it about the act of measurement that moves you from a realm of possibility to a realm of actuality? Somehow the observer is involved, but in what way? What does it take for a measurement to take place? What's required? Do you need consciousness? Could a robot do it? We don't know. The measurement problem, I think it was identified about 1930 or so, it's unsolved. It's big. We don't know. What is the role of the observer in the natural world that takes us from potential to actuality? But of course, another major unresolved question in this 20th century physics is you have two extraordinarily elegant, profound, powerful theories, and that is quantum mechanics on the one hand and general relativity on the other. Neither one's going away. They're too good, but they're not integrated. They're not integrated. That would be the grand unified theory and nobody's come up with it. So that revolution is in progress. The second great revolution in physics. But now we go to, we go to the mind sciences. And I'd like to get a little bit of historical perspective here to point out one element that I think is absolutely an indispensable catalyst to bring about a revolution in any field of science. And that is the development of extraordinary, sophisticated, advanced methods of empirical observation. If you don't have that, the revolution is not going to take place. That'll be my premise. You've got to observe the phenomena you're really interested in, and you've got to observe it beyond folk astronomy or folk psychology or folk biology. Get professional. And so when I think of the first great revolution in the, in the physical sciences, I don't think of Copernicus. He was a brilliant mathematician. He was not a brilliant experimenter. He was not a brilliant observer. He'd get up on the roof of his monastery, he'd look at the stars with the best of them. He didn't do anything innovative there. His mathematical theory, that was innovative. So they called it the Copernican Revolution. Kepler himself was not a great observer. He got all his data from Tycho Brahe, who was a very powerful observer, very brilliant Danish astronomer. But Kepler, like Copernicus, was a great mathematician. It was Galileo that brought in the full package. Galileo was the observer, he was the engineer, he was the one that reinvented the telescope, which had actually had been invented in Holland. He tried to order one, somebody snipped it on the way. You know, he Googled and got, got one on the way and, and then they snipped it in the mail. And so he was there bummed out he didn't get his telescope because somebody snipped it, you know? And he said, the heck with it, I'll make my own. So he did, he made himself a 20 power, tele 20, 20 power telescope and he did something unprecedented. The telescope was already there, but Galileo was the innovator, and he used it in unprecedented ways. Instead of just Googling or goggling, mm, looking at the girls across the street in Holland, he directed it upwards. And everywhere he looked, can you imagine how thrilling this must have been? That everything he looked at, he was discovering something nobody had ever seen before. He took his telescope and directed it to the moons, and he saw craters for the first time in humanity's history. Turned it to Jupiter, he saw the moons for the first time. Turned it to the sun, he saw sunspots. Turned it to Venus, he saw the phases of Venus. Wouldn't that be thrilling? That's what was needed. He too was a mathematician, but he was an experimenter. He was rolling balls down a ramp to see whether they went at constant velocity or they accelerated. He did actually drop objects off the Tower of Pisa. I've been there and asked the people at the University of Pisa. He did it all. And he also brought it out into the world. He didn't write in Latin like so many of his contemporaries. He wrote in Italian. He brought it home. He was the full package. He was the consummate first great scientist that brought it all together. Among the things he did 
which was seminal, which is indispensable for this triggering of the first great revolution in the physical sciences was his use of the telescope. He was making observations like nobody had ever done before. The mathematics was there. The observation, that was crucial. Otherwise, what they were doing with Copernicus's heliocentric system was very cool math mathematical system, but we already have one, thanks very much. And ours covers, covers the data, it accounts for the appearances, so does yours, so whatever, it's a matter of choice. But it's not a matter of choice when you start seeing the phases of Venus. It's not a matter of which one do you like, like, you know, do you like ice cream or, or do, you like, do you like fudge brownies? By this rigorous observation of material phenomena, he was the one, I think, more than anybody else that launched the true revolution, the first great revolution, and it was in the physical sciences. In a similar fashion, Darwin spent about 25 years in very meticulous, rigorous, careful observation of biological phenomena. Of course, in the Galapagos, we all know about that, but no, it wasn't just the Galapagos. He was doing years of study, observing, 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 and then in 1859 came up with this great monu monumental work, The Origins of the Species, that would not have happened had he not been meticulously observing the bi biological phenomena. It wasn't just staying home at his estate and thinking really deeply about biology. It wasn't by doing really good physics. It was by observing biological phenomena carefully and then drawing from that and, and developing his spectacular theory of evolution. Well, then we get to 1890. We get to the closing years of the 19th century, first decade of the 20th century. And a person I believe is of equal stature, William James. I have to admit he's one of my heroes, so look out. I really love this guy. Because he was brilliant. He was an MD. He was a biologist. He was a spectacular philosopher. He wrote the greatest American treatise on religious experience ever, the varieties of religious experience. He was a psychologist. He started the first neuroscience lab, experimental psychology lab in the United States at Harvard. He was a brilliant philosopher, religious studies scholar, scientist, MD, biologist, psychologist, and he was so dogma free. That's what I love about this guy. He wasn't buying into any dogma, but he was an empiricist. In fact, he started a school of, of, of philosophy called radical empiricism. William James came to the mind and this is something that had been postponed for 300 years from the time of Copernicus. Can you imagine 300 years of the development of science, of physics, chemistry, biology, astronomy, geology, etc., etc., 300 years before they actually started the scientific study of the mind. That should throw you back for a moment if you've not quite thought of it in those terms. This is bizarre. The mind is that with which you're doing all the science. It would be like somebody giving you an instrument and say, use this instrument, you'll discover a lot of things, and waiting 300 years before you actually look at the instrument itself. That is weird. But there were very good reasons for it, and, and today we have too short a time to really explore them in depth. But of course, for those first 300 years, science, the natural sciences, established a reputation, a spectacular reputation, well-earned reputation, for studying objective, quantifiable, physical phenomena. Objective, quantifiable, physical phenomena. So you can bring in the full weight of mathematics, the technology which is there, starting from the telescope, moving right through all the extraordinary advances in technology. But mental phenomena, emotions, thoughts, mental images, desires, memories, expectations, the whole array, visual perception, auditory, mental perception, dreams, these are not objective, they're subjective. They're not quantifiable, they're qualitative. They're not clearly physical. I mean, the last time you've had a dream, look at the contents of the dream and ask, what physical attributes do the contents of your dream have? And the answer is none. Or your emotions, your desires, your hopes and fears, your feelings, your thoughts and mental images. They don't have any physical attributes at all. You observe them and they don't, they're not physical. At least they certainly don't appear physical. If they are physical, then they're really concealing something. And so William James was presenting perhaps the greatest challenge in the history of science with its 300 years of spectacular success. You are, we, because he himself was a biologist, an MD, we have gotten extremely good using scientific method to explore the objective, quantifiable, physical. And now can we take this same expertise, this same methodological rigor, and apply it to that which is by nature subjective, qualitative, and perhaps non-physical. And he said, let's do it in a way, the old-fashioned way. And that is, let psychology be, pr above all, the study of mental phenomena as we experience them immediately. And for that, like 
physics, likes biology. Let us catalyze a revolution in the mind sciences. Let us start and do it the old-fashioned way, carefully, meticulously, rigorously observe the phenomena themselves. He proposed this. He didn't do it. They tried it. They namby-pambied around with it for about 20, 30 years. And then they stopped. Now, William James wasn't the, old, the only person. William James started the first experimental psychology lab at Harvard in 1879. And here was his kind of mission statement in terms of methodology. He said, introspective observation is what we have to rely on first and foremost and always. The word introspection, actually we had no quotation marks there, take out that middle quotation mark. He continues, the word introspection need hardly be defined. It means, of course, the looking into our own minds and reporting what we there discover. In other words, just as Galileo was an empiricist and Darwin was an empiricist, when we finally get around to the mind, let's be equally empirical and study the phenomena themselves. Now, in presenting this, he did not at all disparage or try to marginalize studying the mind by way of behavior. So the whole behavioral science is inferring states of consciousness, mental processes, and so forth by way of behavior. Extremely valuable. He did not disparage that. So we're looking at the fruits, the effects of mental processes by studying behavioral output. Excellent. And then, of course, they knew back then that the, the brain is crucially important in generating mental states, processes, and so forth. So causally, look at the mind indirectly by looking at the neural causes giving rise to mental phenomena. Look at the mind indirectly by looking at the behavioral output or effects of mental phenomena. But first and foremost and always, look at the mental phenomena and let your science be based upon the actual careful observation of the phenomena themselves. Now in the same year that William James started this first experimental psychology lab at Harvard, Wilhelm Wundt, the German psychologist in Germany, started the same, in the same year he started his own experimental psychology lab. And he echoed a very similar theme. He said the service which it, the experimental method, or what we call the scientific method, the service which the scientific method can yield consists essentially in perfecting our inner observation, or rather, as I believe, in making this really possible in any exact sense. That is, anybody can introspect a little bit. Are you happy right now or sad, interested or bored, agitated or calm? You don't need to look at your behavior. You don't ask, have to go to an EEG or to an FMRI and ask, you know, how, how am I doing? Tell, what, tell, me, what, tell me why my brain scan tells me. To some level, to some rudimentary level, right now you can have some idea what's going on in your mind. Are there a lot of thoughts arising? Are you falling asleep? And so forth. So emotional states, cognitive states, the focus of your attention, the scatteredness of your attention. But what both William James and Wilhelm Wundt, these two giants on the two sides of the Atlantic Ocean, were suggesting is take your folk psychology, your folk untrained introspection, and start refining it, honing it, intensifying it. Make this a sophisticated method of inquiry. This is the battle cry. This is the great challenge for the mind sciences. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. 1913, especially in America, John Watson at Johns Hopkins University. William James was just cooling off in the grave. And another movement came in. It was almost like a palace coup. And John Watson in 1913 said, from now on, the scientific study of the mind is going to avoid all psychological subjective terms. We will not use the terms belief and emotion, thought, perception. We're not going to use any of those subjective terms at all. They have no place in psychology. This is bizarre. We're going to have a science of the mind, but by the way, we won't use any mental terminology at all. We're going to treat the mind as if it's a black box containing only dispositions, proclivities for behavior, and we're going to confine ourselves to studying the non-mind by way of behavior. In other words, we're going to flatten, like stamping on a tin can, we're going to flatten the study of mental phenomena, treat them as if they don't exist, and reduce psychology to the study of behavior. It's back to the good old-fashioned way of objective, quantifiable, and physical, rather than picking up the gauntlet that William James had thrown out and said, it's time to start something afresh. Attend to the mental phenomena. And John Watson said, no thanks. These radical behaviorists, this is going on from 1913, building on momentum, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, 50s. 1953, 40 years later, B.F. Skinner comes out and says, mental phenomena do not exist. There's no such thing as emotion, 
mental images, thoughts, desires, hopes, and fears, they don't exist at all. In fact, consciousness is a word that refers to nothing at all. It's a superstition. Your jaws should be dropping down to your, your kneecaps at this point. What? And he said, well, after all, they can't exist. They don't have physical attributes. What? This is the absolute trumping of dogma over experience. Because they've decided now, B.F. Skinner writing in 1953, the only things that exist are physical. The only things that exist are physical and the properties of the physical mental phenomena clearly don't have any physical attributes, therefore they don't exist. Appearances to the contrary, well, tough luck on appearances. And he kept on saying that until 1974. He kept on saying, he never learned. And he wasn't some yahoo at Podunk State University. He was a full professor at Harvard University and saying these things looked like he's brain dead. I mean, it really should astound us that such a highly intelligent person, I say with respect, can say such an, a ridiculous thing. It compares to Descartes' statement, also operating under the dogma, now it's the dogma of the Roman Catholic Church in the 17th century, when he equated consciousness with the human immortal soul. Only human beings have immortal souls, animals don't. If you, if you equated consciousness with an immortal soul, you now, in one-step logic, have to come to the conclusion that animals are not conscious. Because they don't have an immortal soul, they don't go to heaven or hell, therefore your dog has no consciousness, which means no feelings. Try to swallow that one if you can. Well, even back then they thought, what, Descartes? We thought you were a pretty smart guy, but what? But which is more, pardon me, but idiotic? To say, your dog has no feelings, or you have no feelings? Again, when I was studying this at Stanford, when I was studying philosophy of mind, we learned that actually that whole school of behaviorism that dominated American academic psychology for 50 or 60 years can be refuted with a joke. I mean, it's tough when a whole system can be refuted with a joke, but it can be. Man and a, a man and a woman make love. The man rolls over, lights up a cigarette, and he says, it was great for you. How was it for me? <laughs> that should pretty well do it for behaviorism. But we, act, we can ask, how is it that brilliant minds, psychologists at Harvard, Berkeley, Princeton, Stanford, Chicago, how could they settle for 50 or 60 years on something so bizarre and so radically anti-empirical? And I asked my professor of philosophy of mind at Stanford this. You know, the refutation of this was a piece of cake. It was, it was one page refutation. Any sophomore, even with a hangover, could have written it. How come they didn't get it? These were smart people. Why didn't they get it? And, and the professor smiled, smiled at me with a whimsical grin and said, well, after all, it was a matter of fashion. Well, that's a nice way of saying groupthink. It's a nice way of thinking or saying mm, lemmings. This introspection fall by the wayside. It was, thrown out, it was thrown out the back window, and they didn't look back. And so this challenge of William James and Wilhelm Wundt bring introspection and make it scientific, has been ignored and has been ignored to this day. So I'm finding a parallel here. If we go back to Galileo, his telescope, kind of trouble he got himself into, there was a medieval theological resistance to Galileo's empiricism, to his using the telescope and discovering things that violated the principles of a literal reading of the Bible and the metaphysical assertions of Aristotle. Because until Galileo, for the most part, people interested in the, in the stars were astrologers. And they would do folk astronomy, they'd look up at the stars, but what they were really interested in is the terrestrial correlates of celestial phenomena. That is, should I get married tomorrow or next month? When shall I sow my crops? You know, when was my birthday? Am I get, you know? And so working out your horoscope, that's what they were really interested in. And that's where the professionals were, in making, drawing up the horoscopes. And they left astronomy at pretty much a folk level. And when Galileo said, look, I've got a telescope, I'm making some fantastic discoveries here, the most conservative of the clerics, the churchmen of his time, refused to look through his telescope, saying, we don't need to. If you discover things through your telescope that contradict what we already know to be true, from the Bible and Aristotle, what you're seeing is false. It must be an aberration, an artifact of your lenses, and after all, it's merely an illusion. Why should we bother? We don't need to. Because we already have the Bible and Aristotle. Who are you, Galileo? You think you're an Aristotle? You think you're God? Why should we listen to you? We've got the Bible and Aristotle. What do we need you for and your empirical observations? So they refused to use it, and they refused to accept the discoveries. They grounded him. They put him under house arrest. They said, go to your room and stay there for the rest of your life. 
you know, like mom and dad getting really irritated at their teenage kid. But now we have, Galil we have Galileo of the modern times, we have William James saying, we have a whole new kettle of fish here, we have a domain of the natural world. In other words, this is not a supernatural infusion from God, these are natural phenomena, these mental phenomena. Let's follow Galileo's cue and, follow and observe them carefully. What do we have in response from the behaviorists, from the cognitive psychologist, and the cognitive neurophysiologist, which are really, they are very prominent these days. What do we have here? We have a focus on the behavioral and neural correlates of mental phenomena, but introspection as a sophisticated, refined mean of observation, by and large a refusal. By and large, in psych departments, neuroscience departments, if you introduce, hey, how about really some refined introspection, they'll say, sorry, we're busy. We're busy, we're studying the brain, we're studying the hippocampus, we're studying, you know, we're studying aspects of psychology. We don't need it, and, and if, you, if you claim to have some discoveries from introspection, well, whatever, but we're busy. And after all, introspection gives rise to only the appearances of the mind. They're illusory after all, so why should we bother? Let's get back and study the hardware. And let's start a new neuroscience lab. But there's a certain limitation in this orientation of insisting that everything that is real must be physical. Everything boils down to physics. And that is just to do a waltz through history here. Think about Copernicus. Think about the Ptolemaic mathematicians who are crunching the numbers, coming up with one epicycle, one eccentric after another. Great mathematicians, really not that great for observ observing celestial phenomena. And if you can imagine confining your understanding just to mathematics, you're sitting in a room and you're a great mathematician, there's nothing in pure mathematics that defines mass or energy. It's not there, not in pure mathematics. There's nothing that defines the emergence of physical phenomena in the universe. There's nothing in pure mathematics that predicts that there ever would be a universe. And in pure mathematics, there's nothing that explains the emergence of matter and energy. When would it happen? When was the Big Bang? When did you start getting particles and so forth and so on? You have to step outside of mathematics as Galileo did and combine the mathematics with empirical observation. But now we shift over into the realm of physics and imagine for the time being that you only know physics but you don't know anything about bio biology or psychology. Confine your understanding just to physics, class and mechanics, electromagnetism, thermodynamics, the whole range of physics. I would suggest there's, you're going to see the parallel here, there's nothing in physics per se that defines life. If you don't know anything about biology, there's nothing in physics that defines life or alive and dead, healthy and sick. These words don't mean anything in physics. That's where my scientific training was. Those two words don't crop up. Life and death, healthy and sick, flourishing and so forth, they don't crop up. There's nothing in physics that defines life. There's nothing in the laws of physics, classical mechanics and all the way through, that predicts that at some point in the universe life would emerge. There's nothing there. It happened, but physics didn't tell you it would happen. And once it has happened, physics on its own does not explain life. The shift to biology. Now we've got mathematics, physics, and biology. But if you confine your understanding to biology alone with its physics and mathematics behind it, there's nothing in biology that defines consciousness. Consciousness is not defined in biological terms. There's nothing in biology that predicts the emergence of consciousness. At what point in the evolution of life in the universe or on our planet where we know it takes place, at what point did consciousness happen and why? There's nothing in biology that predicts it, Nothing in biology that defines it, and once it's there, biology does not explain consciousness in living organisms. And now let's finally move to psychology. So finally we're in the mind sciences, and we're studying attention and volition and perception and memory and so forth. But in psychology alone, there are people throughout the planet, in the United States and everywhere else, for millennia who have been having religious experiences. Call it spiritual, call it religious, but a sense of the transcendent, something larger, and so forth. This is happening. It's been happening a long time. It's happening to this day. But there's nothing in psychology, per se, that predicts that this would ever happen, that defines religious experience in its own terms rather than reducing it to something very prosaic like hysteria, form of neurosis, form of psychosis, and so forth. In drawing it down to psychology, you miss what was there that was distinctive, distinctively spiritual or religious. Psychology by itself does not define, predict, or explain the emergence of religious experience. And yet there it is, it happens. So this would be an argument not against math, physics, or biology, or psychology, but saying it's arguing 
for epi epi epistemic pluralism. And that is, let's get off this, this, out of this rut of thinking that everything can be explained in terms of the more primitive and recognize we need different modalities of inquiry, that it, everything does not boil down to physics or to biology. In this physicless worldview, which in, in many ways has so much going for it, I mean, we know about what happened during the nanoseconds after the Big Bang. That is spectacular. We know about the inner, the nucleus of an, of a tom, of, of an atom, quarks with charm and color and so forth. That's spectacular. We know about the constitution of galactic clusters 10 billion light years away. That is amazing. But what about consciousness? That which makes all of science possible. It's the blind spot. I would call it metaphorically the retinal blind spot in the scientific vision where the optic nerve cover, touches the back of the retina. And you know what happens there? What we should have is we're walking around with two dark spots in our visual field. Right? We should have that because there's no information coming in from those spots. But what does our cunning brain do? It covers over the area about which you know nothing at all. It covers it over with the environment. So if you're looking at a brown wall, it covers in with brown. If you're looking at a purple wall, it covers over with purple. It covers over that which you don't know at all with that which is familiar and gives you an illusion of knowledge. Interesting. Well, what, what is there in the retinal blind spot of the scientific vision of reality? I would suggest it's consciousness. We have no scientific definition of consciousness. That's a bad start. If consciousness is a natural phenomenon, for heaven's sake, let's have a definition. How can you study it if you don't even define what you're studying? That's a problem. But for any empiricist, it's a crucial point that we have no objective means of detecting consciousness. There's a word for a type of technology that doesn't exist. It's called a psychometer. It would be like a Geiger counter that you could point to a rock and a plant and to a, an amoeba and to a baby during the first trimester and during the last trimester and to an old person who's got Alzheimer's and become vegetative and so forth. And you bring out your little psychometer. It would go, <coughs> no, the computer's not, not conscious. And then to the, the insect eating plant and the rat and the cockroach etc. And you would get it on a, a, like a Geiger counter. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a 10 psycho, psychometers or something. It would be, you know, psycho, psychological units. That's how conscious it is. It would be marvelous to have such technology. The only problem is we don't have it. That's why there's such an enormous debate still about abortion. No person wants to kill babies. These are not evil people on either side of the fence, but nobody's got a clue when that, that thing in the womb is conscious. So is it 12 days? Is it, as the Muslims say, 120 days? Is it, as the Roman Catholics say, at conception? Who's got a clue empirically? We don't have any objective means of detecting the presence or absence of consciousness in anything. Mineral, plant, animal, humans, etc. That makes it tough to have a science of consciousness. What are the neural correlates of consciousness? That is, whenever we have a, we have a conscious being, we, we can come, you're conscious, I'm going to be, I'll bet my life on it, you are conscious. And yet, what are the neural correlates? What's invariably happening when you are conscious? What are the neural We don't know. They're called the NCC, the neural correlates of consciousness, haven't been identified yet. Let alone consciousness, we don't even know what the neural correlates of consciousness are. Here's a crucial one. What are the necessary and sufficient causes of consciousness? Well, we don't have to speak about it in the abstract. Let's say visual perception. We know a lot about the visual cortex. It's, it's the area of the brain that is really pretty well mapped out. We know in a human being the visual cortex is necessary for us to see color, for visual perception to take place. So we know that visual cortex, the optic nerve, the retina, are necessary for the generation of visual perception in human beings. But are, do you need a visual cortex if you're, if you're developing some artificial intelligence and you want it to be conscious, but you're not going to give it a brain, a gushy brain, you want it to work it out with silicon chips? So is a visual cortex necessary in an instrument of artificial intelligence? We don't know. We don't know what the sufficient causes are, whether it's sufficient just to have a visual cortex and photons coming in. We don't know what the necessary or sufficient causes are for visual perception, let alone any other kind of consciousness. So any assumptions about what happens to consciousness at death are just assumptions. Because you, if to know, to speak with confidence and knowledge, consciousness terminates at death, you would have had to identify the necessary and sufficient causes and know at least the sufficient causes and aren't there. But we don't know what they are, so frankly, we don't know what happens to consciousness at death. And we finally come to what David Chalmers, the philosopher of mind, called the hard problem. And that is the chemicals, electricity inside the skull, they're really ordinary. 
They're just what chemists have been studying for, for decades and decades. And de there are no mystical neurons. There's no mystical chemicals or electrons in there. It's really ordinary stuff. So how is it that neurons generate subjective experience? What is it about those chemicals and electricity that enables them to generate subjective experience, mental states, or even influence mental states? And moreover, we know from the placebo effect that when you go to a doctor and you receive a tablet and you believe it will help, the placebo effect is going to kick in big time. Just your belief, your expectation, your desire and trust will have enormous impact on your body, your brain, your immune system. The pharmaceutical industry knows this very well. How is that possible that you can go from an idea, a faith, a belief, and it actually influences physical health? We don't know. So when we add up all of that ignorance, it comes hard to say that we actually have a science of consciousness. It falls in the retinal blind spot. But nevertheless, we cover over that retinal blind spot with the assumption, with assumptions, or what I would call an illusion of knowledge. And John Searle, very distinguished philosopher of mind, expresses this illusion of knowledge, although he's expressing it as knowledge. When he writes, there is a simple solution to the mind-body problem. Isn't that good relief? It's a simple problem. And, and here, the news gets better. This solution has been available to any educated person since serious work began on the brain nearly a century ago. And in a sense, we all know it to be true. That should be a relief. And here it is. Mental phenomena are caused by neurophysiological processes in the brain. Yeah, of course. We know that. You know, knock out your visual cortex, you don't see any longer. Knock out hippocampus, other things don't happen. Frontal cortex, other things. We know that. But wait a minute, there's a catch. Mental phenomena are themselves features of the brain. Mental phenomena themselves are physical. Wait a minute, when did we learn that? Where is the empirical evidence that showed equivalence between mental phenomena and neural events rather than neural events taking on the role of causal agents generating resultant mental phenomena? Who demonstrated equivalence? The answer is nobody. But he's saying everybody knows it. How does everybody know something that nobody knows and for which there's no empirical evidence at all of equivalence? Well, happily, one of, one of the foremost people on the front lines of scientific research into consciousness, Christoph Koch, outstanding cognitive neuroscientist, he's the one leading the charge of trying to find the neural correlates of consciousness. He unmasks this illusion when he states, the character of brain states and the phenomenal states, by that means he means mental phenomena, desires, emotions, and so forth, mental phenomena, the character of brain states and mental states appear too different to be completely reducible to each other. Look at brain states. They don't have any mental qualities at all. Observe mental states, phenomena, processes. They don't have any physical properties at all. Bring out all your instruments of technology. They do not detect a single mental event. So why on earth are we equating these when they don't even have any overlapping qualities? And in fact, neural events being causal take generally about a, a hundred milliseconds to generate the resultant mental state. They don't even exist at the same time and point in time. So he's calling a spade a spade here. You know, they're so different, it now seems unlikely that they can be reducible to each other, namely that mental phenomena are nothing other than brain states. He said, I suspect that the, the relationship is more complex than traditionally envisioned. Traditionally envisioned is mental phenomena are just physical. For now, it is best to keep an open mind on this matter. I love it when scientists say that. Let's just acknowledge that we're ignorant. We don't know the nature of mental events. We don't know that they're physical. Let's keep an open mind. But practically speaking, what should we do now? And let's concentrate on identifying the correlates of consciousness in the brain. So it's back to business as usual. It's not picking up the gauntlet that William James threw down. It's going back to the safe. Observing the quantifiable, the physical, the objective, as if you're going to really fathom the nature of consciousness by simply studying the neural correlates that contribute to the generation of consciousness. He's a really good neuroscientist, so we can't blame him for saying, let's focus on the brain. But that doesn't mean all of us should. William James said, please, when are you going to start listening to me? Daniel Borston, a very distinguished historian, American historian, wrote an excellent book called The Discoverers, The History of Mankind's Discovery for the Last 5,000 Years. In the preface of this book, he makes, I think, a very important point. He said, throughout human history, illusions of knowledge, thinking we know something that we don't really know at all, but absolutely being convinced of it, 
Illusions of knowledge and not ignorance have proven to be the principal obstacles to discovery. Ignorance is clean and it's honest. I don't know, can we find out? An illusion of knowledge is, I already know and we don't need to ask. Physical phenomena are, phys mental phenomena are physical. Any more questions? That's an illusion of knowledge. As Christoph Koch makes Koch quite clear, so what I'm proposing here is I try to envision the first revolution in the mind sciences. We haven't had one. Started in 1879, where was the revolution? At what point it was nothing the same because our understanding of the mind has radically shifted like it did with Darwin with respect to life, Galileo with respect to the planet Earth and its place in the universe. And so what I'm suggesting here is we need a renaissance of empiricism. That the empirical examination of physical phenomena, if we look back to the time of Galileo, the empirical examination of physical phenomena dispelled the illusions of knowledge of medieval scholasticism with respect to or regarding physical phenomena. They thought in the 16th century, the 15th century, that knowledge of the universe was pretty well complete. They had the Bible, which is God's own word. They had Aristotle, the philosopher. Thomas Aquinas fused these into one complete, perfect system. Except for it was riddled with illusions of knowledge and Galileo started tipping over that cart and it's never been uprighted since. It was Galileo and then it was Newton and then it was you know, one after another and they kept on showing that what you thought was complete is not only not complete but it's radically flawed because you're mistaking illusions of knowledge for actual knowledge. And I'm suggesting here that the empirical observation of mental phenomena, not just the behavioral and neural correlates, the phenomena themselves Picking up the challenge of William James may dispel the illusions of knowledge of modern physicalism regarding mental phenomena. Physicalism assumes, it insists emphatically, there is nothing in the universe apart from physical phenomena and their emergent properties. Who said? Why should the whole of reality fit into a human conceptual construct? After all, we are the ones who define physical. Nature didn't define it for us. And the very notion of the physical has shifted from the time of Descartes through Galileo, through Newton, through Maxwell, through Max Planck, through Einstein, through Stephen Hawking. It's a moving target. Everything is reducible to physics. Great. Which physics? The physics of yes, yesterday or today or a hundred years from now? Where's the moving target stop? At what point can you physicists say, okay, we've got it under, under, under wraps now. We know what the physical are and mental phenomena have to fit into that box. The day you state, stated that, you've just stopped doing physics and you've become a medieval scholastic. We now know what is physical. And nature happily fit into our conceptual construct. Nature, the whole of nature fit into our box, and we call it physical. That's not scientific, that's dogmatic. And so perhaps the empirical observation of mental phenomena may dis 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 dispel this illusion of knowledge, not from medieval scholasticism, but from modern scholasticism. Now happily, our Euro-American, Australian, and now our modern, because it's in Singapore, it's in Bangkok, it's in Argentina, it's in Brazil. It's not just the West now, it's the vision of modernity. Happily, we are not the only intelligent life in the universe, our Euro-American civilization. Happily, there have actually been other civilizations on this planet that have had the same, statistically, the same scattering of geniuses as our Euro-American civilization. But they weren't us. They weren't in the Mediterranean basin. They didn't come out of the Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They didn't come out of the Greek heritage, Plato and Aristotle. Other civilizations like that of China for 5,000 years, India for who knows how many thousands of years. Might they have come up with anything that we haven't? It's one of those questions you don't often ask. At least not in academia. I've been there. It's not one of the questions that comes up. We're just assuming that we trump everybody. But India, classical India, they, unlike Galileo, unlike the founders of our scientific revolution, they were not seeking a God's eye view of objective reality. They were not creating or assuming an absolute demarcation, a bifurcation between subject and object, and trying to observe the purely objective world from an absolutely outside perspective, God's own perspective. That just wasn't on the agenda for the Indians, for these classical Indian truth seekers they were seeking to understand the world of experience, not some objective world independent of experience. In Sanskrit, called loka. Now, if that's your agenda, to understand the world of experience, not a God's eye view of something that transcends experience, if that's what your focus is, in German philosophy, by the way, it's called Lebenswelt, from the phenomenological tradition of Husserl and Heidegger. 
if what you're primarily understand, wishing to understand is the world of experience, then the study of the mind has to be first, foremost, central to your inquiry in the natural, into the natural world because the world of experience doesn't even exist without consciousness. There is no world of experience without somebody experiencing it. And so for the Indians, the study of the mind was the first thing they tackled. In modern science, it was kind of like the last thing they studied. Consciousness itself was, didn't even come up in psychology for almost 100 years. Only in the last 10 or 15 years has consciousness become a legitimate object of inquiry for cognitive neuroscientists, for psychologists. When I studied cognitive psychology at Stanford, consciousness was not there. It wasn't even in the index. And introspection was mentioned only in the preface when they said, we tried it, it didn't work. And they moved right on. The Indians happily are not part of our Mediterranean basin box. They have their own areas, and this is one of them. The Sanskrit term is samadhi. And I'm proposing here that it's a type of telescope of the mind. These revolutionary truth seekers, and they were revolutionary, because they were, they were kicking away from an old, tired, dusty religious system called the Brahmanic tradition, heavily institutionalized, ritualistic, dogmatic, close-minded. And they said, enough. And these shramanas, or these truth seekers, roughly maybe 3,000 years ago, they set out to understand the world of experience with a primary emphasis on mind. And the first thing they discovered is, if you're going to try to observe mental phenomena, your observation of it has to be introspective, but your attention is wobbling all over the place. Right? It was ADHD 3,000 years ago. Yet you're either getting dopey and falling asleep, you know, falling asleep at the wheel, or your mind's scattered all over the place. How can you make rigorous, sustained observations of the mental phenomena if your attention is wobbling all over the place, oscillating between dullness and agitation? So the first thing they did, and they were very good at it by the time the Buddha came along 2,500 years ago, is they developed extraordinarily effective techniques for refining and focusing attention. Rather like a telescope, firmly mounted on a tripod, polished lenses, large aperture, so you can make stable, vivid observations, now not of stars, because they weren't that interested, but they were fascinated to study the mind. And they developed a, t a telescope of the mind, the like of which we have never developed. And modern science since William James has not made any progress at all. Now that was the, the groundwork laid, like the Dutch lens, ma lens makers who started off before Galileo. And there was this historical individual, Buddha, Gautama, and I would say he was to India what Galileo was for the West. He took a pre-existing technology, but it was a contemplative technology of refining attention. And he applied it in unprecedented ways. Instead of simply going into a state of samadhi, experiencing bliss and equanimity and euphoria and so forth, he stabilized the mind and then he used it to explore states of consciousness, ordinary states, extraordinary states, but rigorous, careful, empirical observation of mental states, states of consciousness and made extraordinary discoveries, at least that is, the, that is the claim. Not for us to take as religion, that would be boring, but to take as hypotheses, they said they discovered this, just like any good scientist, you hear somebody over there in Beijing made a discovery in their lab, good, can we replicate it? That's the first thing that comes up. Somebody in Korea said they cloned, they've cloned a dog, they've done this and this, good, let's replicate it. Whoops, that was a phony. So write them off, get back to work. But this is what scientists are doing all the time. Somebody makes a claim, replicate it. And this is exactly what the Buddha encouraged. He said, these are my discoveries, but don't just take my word for it. See if you can replicate it. And here is the experimental procedure. Refine your attention. Well, here's the overall framework. First of all, cultivate a way of life, your whole way of behaving in the world that is conducive to social flourishing so that here at Google, you can all get along together happily, harmoniously. You know how that happens, it's called ethics. No ethics, you're gonna be all, you know, ripping each other's hair out. Without ethics, no harmony. With ethics, you've got a chance. But also our relationship with the environment at large, with Mountain View, with the state of California, the planet Earth, there is a way that we can live in harmony with our natural environment without sucking it dry and leaving the husks to our children. It's called ethics, environmental ethics. And so that was the foundation. Upon the basis of that, developing mental balance, refining the mind, refining attention, developing exceptional levels of mental health and well-being, and with that basis, then becoming a true contemplative scientist and using a refined attention to explore states of consciousness, giving rise to a sense of spiritual flourishing, or some would call liberation. So I'm suggesting something dramatic, something revolutionary here, and you notice I said nothing original at all. It was William James, it was Wilhelm Wundt, it was Buddha. 
suggesting this is the way to go to understand the nature of the mind. Don't be satisfied by just studying the physical correlates. You're always going to get that which is around consciousness but not the nature of consciousness. Should we be skeptical of that? And the answer is yes, said Richard Feynman, the great Nobel laureate in physics. He said one of the ways of stopping science would be only to do experiments in the region where you know the law, play it safe. You want to understand consciousness? Stick to the brain. You'll get tenure. You'll publish in peer-reviewed journals. Go introspection route and oh, you are on thin ice. But he said experimenters search most diligently and with the greatest effort in exactly those places where it seems most likely that we can prove our theories wrong. There's a theory, the mind is just the brain. The mind is just an epiphenomenon of the brain. The mind, mental phenomena are physical. Maybe it's true. But the good skeptic, not the one that's skeptical of other people's views, the person who's skeptical of his own assumptions, says, let's put that one to the test. In other words, he says, in other words, we are trying to prove ourselves wrong as quickly as possible, because only in that way can we find progress. Now, science is known for skepticism. Religion is known for dogmatism. But what did the Buddha say here? This great Galileo of India. He said, in response to a bunch of skeptics, he said, you are skeptical about what you should be skeptical about. He said, do not be led right by reports or tradition or hearsay. Do not be led by authority of religious texts or by mere logic and inference all by itself, nor by considering appearances. Just taking a casual look, taking all appearances at face value, nor by delight in speculative opinions, nor by seeming possibilities, nor by the idea, this is my teacher, what he said must be right. But when you know for yourselves that certain things are unwholesome, destructive, and detrimental, then reject them. And when you know for yourself that certain things are wholesome and good, then accept them and follow them. In other words, be a skeptic. He encouraged his own followers to be skeptical. So Occam's razor was used to great effect coming out of the medieval era into the Renaissance. As Occam said, the principle is, it is vain to do with more assumptions what can be done with fewer assumptions. What I'm suggesting here is we have too many assumptions in the scientific study of the mind. Let us use Occam's razor to shave off the assumption that mental, physical phenom mental phenomena are physical. It's just an assumption. Christoph Koch points out they don't look physical. Why should they be? And if we shave off that assumption, what have we lost? What less do we know? And I would suggest nothing. We still know the neural correlates. We know just about as much about the brain and behavior as we did before. We've just shaved off an assumption that's never been corroborated. Throw that one out and now apply a fresh method of inquiry of introspection to actually observe mental phenomena and what might we gain? And the answer is we don't know until we try it. As we draw this to a close, we come back to William James who suggested in terms of this interface, science, religious, religion, and empiricism, he said, let empiricism once become associated with religion, as hitherto, through some strange misunderstanding, it has been associated with irreligion, and I believe that a new era of religion, as well as philosophy, will be ready to begin. I fully believe that such an empiricism is a more natural ally than dialectics ever were or can be of the religious life. In other words, introduce inter in empiricism into religion as much as science, throw out dogma on both sides of the fence, and let's see what the fireworks display. Final point here is, I suggest it towards a first revolution in the mind sciences. I would suggest that we haven't had one because there's been too much dogma suppressing the empirical study of mental phenomena themselves as opposed to the physical correlates. But now there's a possibility, as we have access to Buddhism and Hinduism, the Sufi tradition, psychology, neuroscience, we no longer are isolated. Here at Google, you know this may be better than anybody else. You are on the globe. Your physical plant happens to be in Mountain View, but it could be in the Amazon, right? We are now living in a globe where we can integrate like never before, integrate these rigorous first-person and third-person methodologies from the contemplative, the psychological, the neuroscientist, in collaboration between cognitive scientists, the whole broad range, and contemplatives who have exceptional mental skills and insights resulting from rigorous, sustained mental training and observing and experimenting with states of consciousness. So there would be a challenge to break down the barriers, to throw out dogma and uncorroborated assumptions, and open up a new kind of a renaissance of empiricism in the, in the scientific study of the mind that would be profoundly contemplative and experiential and yet rigorously scientific. That could revolutionize the contemplative traditions. It could revolutionize science. And it could bring this unfortunate rift between religion and science, creationism in the school district that makes most of us gag, and so forth, start breaking down those barriers and see about integrating 
East and West, ancient and modern, and cast a fresh light on the nature of the mind and on human identity. It's a possibility. That's my hope. So, anybody has questions or observations or debates? Anything is welcome. Yes. So, Versig um, kind of asked some more questions. Robert Versig asked yes. and, and came back to the rift that instead of looking so much at Buddhism, looked at the kind of split within the, uh, the Greek thought as one of the original places we ought to look uh, mm -hmm. for resolving this. And, um, and then there's also, of course, Ken Wilber who looks sure. and says, you know, they didn't look in a particular place, look at all the traditions. Yes, exactly. Can you kind of comment on why, why Buddhism particularly, or is it just one way? Or, uh, it's just one way. I was using that in a short presentation. I was saying, here's a good, a good sampling. This was not promoting Buddhism versus Hinduism or the Muslim tradition or the Taoist tradition, not at all. I was saying, this is a good example from a very rich, well-developed, intellectually, very sophisticated contemplative tradition. But the Santa Barbara Institute, which I founded, is not a Buddhist institution. It is an intercontemplative tradition, drawing from the wealth of East and West, co contemplative traditions all from all over the world, interfacing these with the best of science. So it's not plugging any one tradition, and it's certainly not trying to validate Buddhism or any particular school, very much the contrary. These great contemplative traditions have been after universal truths and not just trying to corroborate Buddhist ideas. And I'm not interested in that at all. So I think, going back to Greek thought, back to Plato, back to Pythagoras themselves, to, to, to the notion of noitos, which is a type of mental perception by means of which we can directly observe non-sensual mental phenomena. That's a Greek notion, but we've forgotten it. So I don't want to leave anybody out. That is, indigenous people, East and West, bring it all together because the stakes are high now. We're dealing with something that is central to everybody's existence, and that is consciousness. So let's throw out dogma of all sorts, sectarianism, biases of all sorts, and not leave anybody out, not leave out the contemplative, not leave out the neuroscientists, for heaven's sakes, not leave out anybody, and really start fusing and taking advantage of the technology and transportation, um, technology including transportation that we have now, so that we can really draw from this wealth of wisdom and insights and multiple methodologies. This epistemic pluralism, I think, is absolutely the key. Yeah. Two, two more questions. Here's one here, please. Um, if you want to approach consciousness in a scientific way, which yeah. I assume you Absolutely. are for, you need some idea of what it means to prove or disprove something. Very true. How do you do that in the absence of physical observation? Very good. So the question is, if this is going to be scientific, and of course science gained its laurels by studying objective things that you can look at it from a third person perspective quantifiable but measurable out there, right? So if one lab does it, another one can corroborate it, and you know, it's pretty clear. And mental phenomena are subjective. There we are. They're, as John Searle says, irreducibly, ontologically, first person, right? But I think a good analogy for this, the question deserves not a two-minute answer. It, des it deserves conferences and really detailed investigation so we don't come up with cheap answers. Cheap answers are easy. But if we take as an example mathematics, now, mathematics is not scribbling things on a board. That's the outer display of it. But anybody who doesn't know mathematics can get, memorize the equations and write with the best of them, with no understanding at all. Mathematics, when I studied higher mathematics in my, 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 my training in physics, it's really it's subjective. It's working through a proof. It's thinking. And you may do something out here on the board. You may not. But the real juice of mathematics is something that's taking, taking place internally and say, well, that, how can mathematic, mathematicians ever speak with each other? How can they know who's great? Well, they get a similar training. They go through an undergraduate, they go through a graduate, they go to postdoc, and after a while they know who gets the Fields Medal. It's not just that he wrote things on the board, it's through dialogue. And he say, oh, we speak a similar language here. Everybody else thinks we're, they can't understand what we're talking about. But you and I have gone through eight years of training in mathematics, and we know the elegant proofs. We know shoddy mathematics. We know the sharp stuff. And so even though it's largely internal, they develop a language, a common training, so they can communicate amongst themselves in ways that outsiders cannot fathom. Now let's imagine, now this is hypothetical in a way, but it's all his, also historical in another. And that is, I spend a lot of time with Tibetans living with, in Tibetan culture, and we have contemplatives there who will go for 10, 20,000 hours of training with a common basis of ideas and training, of contemplative technology and so forth, and they develop a refined, 
how do you say, professional language that they can speak amongst each other, with, amongst themselves, and they know what they're talking about because like the mathematicians, a shared training developing, a shared vocabulary, and then amongst them, and we know this is true in the Tibetan tradition, all the great contemplatives, the great scholars, they know who the cream are. It was Dingo Kensi Rinpoche, it was Ling Rinpoche, it was Kalu Rinpoche. These people, the peers know. To an outsider, it looks like, well, a really sweet monk, really nice guy, good charisma. But the professionals know it's more than that. This guy really has the skivvy. This man really knows what's going on. So I would not ask you to accept that because I'm saying it, but I'm saying this issue has been grappled with. If we take a more prosaic example, wine connoisseurs. And that is when I drink, I got my palate ruined when I was 18 because I got drunk on Red Mountain wine, whiskey, and beer at the same time. And that totaled my tongue for life. You know? So I can't tell any good, good vintage from another. But I've, I've hung out with people who've had that training. It's three years formal training and then years of getting experience. So two wine connoisseurs will come together and say, Is, was it a 1948 or 49? And what part of the vintage, what, you know, what part of France was was raised in? So the taste of wine is very subjective. You can't pick up the taste of wine with some external technology. It will tell you, oh, this is, you know, this is a $500 bottle as opposed to a $5 bottle. No technology will tell you that. But they train. And then they use things like bouquet and, and so forth, words I don't even know what they're talking about. But they have a specialized vocabulary and they know who the brilliant wine connoisseurs are and who are just mediocre. And it's a specialized vocabulary that they know what they're talking about and outsiders like me, I don't have a clue. So wine testing, that's very empirical. The mathematical is very internal. If we try to draw inspiration from those only by analogy, then perhaps we can get some idea but again, the danger, there's all kinds of potholes here, a minefield, and that is they're all being brainwashed in the same way. And that was how introspection fell to its knees and died, is that different labs were simply corroborating their own assumptions, and the, the, the trainees, the observers, their observations were so laden with the theories and assumptions of their mentors that they weren't getting this inter-lab corroboration, so it fell apart, but they gave up too soon. And they didn't go through a 10 or 20,000 hours training not Wilhelm Wundt, not Titchener at Cornell, not James at Harvard. This requires training. If it's going to be professional, don't give them five hours of training or a week of training. How about three years of training, ten years of training? Training the mind ten hours a day.